A very good evening, everyone, and welcome to this very special Climate Council Book Club event, uh, where we'll be talking with author and climate counselor, Dr. Joelle Gerges, who has written this really quite remarkable book, Humanity's Moment, The Climate Scientist's Case for Hope. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of whichever lands you and I are on this evening. Uh, for me, that's the Darug Nation, and I invite everyone to drop into the chat uh, what country uh, they are listening in from. And so I'll pay all of our respects to elders past, present and emerging, and acknowledge that these lands were never ceded. This always was, always will be Aboriginal lands. And in addition, I think it's very important we acknowledge the critical leadership of First Nations here in Australia and worldwide in responding to the climate crisis. Well, my name is Simon Bradshaw. I'm lucky to be the research director at the Climate Council. And I am super excited about this conversation that we're gonna be having with uh, Joelle, who has really been a, a great inspiration for me personally since I joined the Climate Council a couple of years ago. Joelle, as you'll learn, is not only a uh, first-rate climate scientist, but really, in my mind, one of the very best writers on the climate crisis that, that we have. Uh, Joelle has really a rare ability to um, bring immense scientific rigor and deep personal insight and experience. And this book really is designed to help all of us navigate this remarkable moment that we're in, in Earth and humanity's history, and how we can all be rising to this moment and can all be playing our part in creating a brighter future for everyone. So first, Joelle, congratulations on what I think is quite an amazing achievement. It really is. And reading it, honestly, you can you can literally feel that the blood, sweat and tears that's gone into this. You really can. And it really is a, a wonderful gift to the world. Now, look, I've got a ton of questions, um, as is our community. So we should get straight into them. But I think before we really get into some of the substance in this book, because you've packed an immense amount in there, we should start by learning a bit about you, a bit about your motivations for writing this book. I thought perhaps you could start by just telling us a bit about this journey you've been on that you walk us through in the book over the last few years, working as a lead author on the most recent International Governmental Panel on Climate Change Assessment, seeing all these things unfold in real time where you're living with these climate disasters and trying to come to terms with all of that. I think the first thing I want to ask you is, what was the moment through that process, through that journey, when you realized you, you had to write this book, had to get this out there? Great question and good, good evening, everyone. It's really terrific to be here. So why did I write this book? I guess I wrote it because when I started my work um, as a lead author on the IPCC six assessment report, it was 2018. And we'd already just seen mass uh, bleaching of the, of the Great Barrier Reef happen. And we started to see about 50% of that reef uh, die off. And that started to become really alarming to me that we were seeing these extremes happening in real time that were really starting to reconfigure our ecosystems, our communities. And as this report progressed, all these extremes kept escalating right outside my window. And so it became this situation where I really felt compelled to share the reality of what I was actually sitting there compiling from day to day. And I was joining the dots between what I was seeing in front of me in terms of the evidence base, but also what was happening outside. Um, and then the Black Summer came in 2019, 2020, and we saw literally 25% of Australia's forests burn in a single bushfire season. We saw 3 billion animals either killed or displaced. And now we've actually got um, the koala as an, as an endangered species on the east coast of this country. The fact that we could see the koala become extinct in New South Wales as early as 2050 was something to me that I think made me realise that sometimes we think about climate change and we think, oh, this is just going to gradually start to play out. It's incremental. But then we started to see these really nonlinear changes where you can get abrupt things that happen in the climate system and it really does have a really major impact. And then, of course, we also saw the, um, the flooding of the East Coast this year. Um, and when I'm not based in Canberra teaching and doing research, I live in the Northern Rivers. And so I actually had family displaced from Lismore. Um, my husband's from Lismore, grew up there. Uh, and to just see his hometown completely obliterated by 
catastrophic flooding that was not just natural climate variability. I've actually spent my entire career working on natural climate variability. I did my PhD on El Nino, which is the largest source of uh, climate variations on the planet, aside from the seasons. And I realized that basically climate change is happening in real time right now. And it's, it's something as an Australian scientist that I started to feel like I really needed to sound the alarm. And so I'd have editors from places like The Guardian or The Monthly or The Saturday Paper, The Conversation, approaching me to, to, to really try and, and give voice to these um, different events and provide commentary, expert commentary. And so that's what I started to do. And I realised that the only way through um, all of this information that I was in front of was really trying to process it in a way uh, that could also be useful to other people. So it wasn't enough for me to sit there and be able to see everything in front of me. I felt like I really had to share that information. And so I felt really compelled actually to, to write this book because I feel like um, in a country like Australia, we have so much to lose and we're an extraordinary country um, with so much biodiversity and incredible ecosystems and incredible indigenous cultures. And we, we really can do better than this. And so um, I guess I just had a real fire in my belly about writing it uh, and feeling like I had access to so much privileged information as an IPCC author. Uh, and as an Australian, I really felt like I couldn't watch my country being savaged in that way and not say anything. Mm. Well, you've packed an extraordinary amount into this book. You step us through all that latest science. You bring in a lot of your, your own very personal observations of what you'd seen and, and what that meant. And of course, as we'll get to, the latter chapters are just dripping with hopeful, positive messages about what we can all now do. But um, one thing I just wanted to get into a bit more before we look at all of that is there's quite a bit of interest from our community in the IPCC process, because uh, this is a, a mammoth undertaking that you've been part of, you know, one of thousands of volunteer scientists, and you've had to wade through this tremendous amount of science and put together these millions of words reports, gazillions of comments to respond to. So before we dig into the substance, just tell us a bit more about what that's been like, what it took to become an IPCC author, and just a bit of what this remarkable process of putting these reports together involves. Yeah, another really good question. I think really being an IPCC author is the culmination of just the, the years of, of research that I've contributed. And so everybody who's involved in the IPCC is a research scientist of some kind. And so governments of the world put forward nominations of different scientists who are experts in their field. And then from about a thousand nominations, about 240 people from 66 countries were selected to represent um, their nations. And there's about 12 of us from Australia for the Working Group One report, which is the physical science basis, which was the one I was involved in. And so effectively, you're sitting at a table with people from literally all over the world. In my chapter team, um, I worked on the water cycle chapter, had people from Colombia, Pakistan, Russia, France, you name it, it was, it was really truly a, a UN process. And so all of us are bringing um, a real depth of expertise to the table. And then our job is effectively to read hundreds of articles, consolidate the evidence base down. And then with IPCC, we use um, what's called uncertainty language. And so that basically acknowledges that we don't have you know, there's no evenness in the um, in, in the database effectively. So you, we have some some areas of science are really well researched. So we have very high confidence in them. And other areas are emerging, and so we have uh, less confidence in, in those um, in those particular areas. And so effectively, what the IPCC report does is just collate all of that information and provide people with a state of the art assessment of what the research community has to say about all aspects of the climate system. So that is basically our job. Then that goes out to review, um, both to governments and experts. And for um, Working Group One uh, assessment report, there were, I think it was 74,000 different reviewer comments. And we had to respond to each and every one of those, make those um, changes to the text, revise the text, and then all of our responses are made publicly available in a database. It's a huge job. And that's all happening on the background of our day job. So for someone like me, I'm a lecturer in climate science at um, the Australian National University. I'm also a research scientist. I'm also very often called on to speak to the media, provide commentary. So it's effectively like having another job. And because um, of COVID, so we had three lead author meetings, um, which is really 
really the only way forward actually when you are dealing with so many people from different time zones to be in the one room it makes sense so when COVID happened we had to shift online uh, that didn't work out particularly well for people in um, the southern hemisphere very often because most of the authors are from the northern hemisphere so sometimes the meetings would be like 5 a.m on a saturday morning 3 a.m on a tuesday in the middle of the working week for me or six six o'clock on a friday night and so in terms of the dedication involved in a process like that it's truly the stuff of legends. Um, these are some of the most extraordinary people I've ever worked with. Um, everybody gave it their all. And, you know, on the background of all the, the usual things that we're doing in terms of just our jobs, our, our personal lives and so on. So effectively, um, it's a really altruistic uh, endeavour. Um, and it's all in service of, of effectively trying to collate the most comprehensive climate report that is humanly possible. And that's what we've done. Well, I've been studying the book the last couple of weeks. I've got my own very heavily thumbed annotated copy because there is so much in here. Um, and look, ultimately, it's a book with a, a really hopeful, empowering message. But to get us there, I mean, it's quite the roller coaster. And I think in the first few chapters, you, you don't hold back in communicating the seriousness of what we're dealing with, um, the implications of some of this science. And I think are very honest about how confronting that's been for you personally. Um, one thing I was hoping you could talk about a little bit more because it's a dimension of the climate crisis we don't hear enough about here in Australia. I mean, you step us through the science and then you really focus on the, the human dimension of all of this. And particularly you look at how climate change is exacerbating inequality, exacerbating poverty, how the impacts that for, felt first and hardest by some communities who've really contributed negligibly to the problem, excuse me, and have fewer resources to uh, to respond to it. So, and I know that's um, based not just on the science, but your own observations from traveling to different parts of the world. So I wondered if you could, before we get more into the solutions, just talk to us a bit more about that um, real injustice and inequity at the heart of all of this that you talk about and really how that should inform the way we look at things and how we respond. Yeah, I think that's a really good, it's a really good way to think about things. So as a physical scientist, somebody like me is often looking at, you know, graphs of, um, you know, rainfall and temperature or ocean circulation and things like that. But when you stop and you think about what those graphs really mean, they're not just numbers. These are actually people and places that we love and we care about. So sometimes there's this real disconnect between, you know, describing the climate system and then what are those impacts? Uh, and sometimes there's a real disconnect between that. And, and so for me, I guess the IPCC was an opportunity to not only just see what is happening here in Australia, but effectively working at that UN level, it's like having a massive global jigsaw puzzle and you've got all the different pieces, you put it all together and it was a really confronting picture that, that really comes up. And it really does just highlight or really expose those inequalities that are there uh, in, our, in, in, the, um, in our systems. And I, I think it's really something that we sometimes forget about or people get really blasé and say, oh, well, 1.5 is gone. But they don't stop and think, well, 1.5 actually means um, effectively wiping out certain cultures uh, in the Pacific Islands, for, for example, and low-lying areas of the world. That's simply not an option for people um, who are in that position. So for people who are in the, in the comfort of their, um, you know, Western um, nations, for, for them to be kind of blasé about that felt really um, pretty much immoral, really. And I, and I sort of feel that as, as Australians, we have, um, we have the luxury of having stability in our government. We have um, high levels of education and we could be doing a lot better. And, and, and we should be doing a lot better. And so really, I guess when I was writing this book, I realized that there's just so much at stake, not, not just here in Australia, but for vast parts of the developing world where they really don't have the means to be able to address it. So currently there are about, um, about a quarter of a billion people live below uh, two meters uh, in terms of uh, sea level. So in terms of just the exposure, much of that is in tropical Asia and other parts um, of Africa as well. And really, you know, we're talking about the mass displacement of, of large sections of the human population. And when you displace people from their homes, you're also displacing them and cutting off their culture from the roots effectively. And that is just such a disruptive thing to be doing to people. And increasingly, we're seeing that this is 
this is happening. It's playing out right now. There's actually a refugee crisis out there, as, as everyone would be aware. And, and now we're starting to see, uh, you know, really severe climate change impacts. And even in the news, just in the last couple of days, I'm sure many of you have seen the catastrophic flooding that's happening in Pakistan at the moment. It, it's just extraordinary. Every single season, every single year that passes, we're seeing the escalation of these extremes. But then when you actually layer that on the top of um, issues of poverty, um, and in one of the chapters I talk about, um, I take a good look at, at the state of um, poverty. And it really shocked me actually that 25, I think it's about 25% of the population, the world's population lives in slum conditions. Now that's access to no sanitation, no running water, um, no toilets, all that sort of stuff. It's, it, it was really confronting to realize that most people um, in the developed world are just struggling to keep their head above water and climate change is just another layer on top of this. And so we can't necessarily expect people who are really just trying to make, make ends meet to step up and be able to, um, to, to make these really major changes um, that we need. Uh, and so it really comes back down to the developed countries of the world who've actually gotten rich from um, capitalism and uh, colonialism and exploiting um, less fortunate people. And so I, I really think this is a moment where we can start to rebalance that uh, because those inequalities, when you look at them and you look at them on the page, they're irreconcilable in my mind. It's one of those things that I really feel like it's a real opportunity to right the wrongs of the past and to really do some of that healing, whether it be in Indigenous communities or whether it be just in terms of equity. And one of the things I'm sure we'll talk about later is just realising that some of this, um, the potential of renewable energy um, in the tropical you know, the sun belt of the world, um, the equatorial and, and, and um, subtropical areas of the world is extraordinary. So some of these countries will, will become uh, renewable energy superpowers, which I think is, is poetic justice actually, which is terrific. And it's that redistribution of geopolitical power. And I'd love to see that happen uh, because I think the West has really ridden off the back of the developing world for a really, really long time. Well, hold that thought, please do, because I think we're absolutely going to come back and talk to you about some of the, the fact that what, the things we have to do can be a great leveler. They can go a long way towards addressing some of these historical injustices and inequalities. And there's a lot of very good news stories to be talked about there. Um, just before we start exploring that, um, actually, I think I'm just going to dip into the book and read a paragraph out here. Um, during this time of great turning, it's easy to lose hope. With so much loss, destruction and suffering, it's sometimes hard to imagine that we could pull back from this in time to avert a horrific cascade of destabilization that will reconfigure the planet and human life as we know it. It's an extraordinary time to be a climate scientist on the front line, front line as the end of the world unfolds. It's actually one of um, a number of extracts from your personal journey journals that you've put into this book. Um, there's many deeply personal moments in here. Um, one thing that struck me is that, I mean, you've clearly been to places of, of, of deep despair, um, absorbing this climate science, realizing its implications. And yet through the book, you know, you find perspectives on this that leave you incredibly, you know, fired up about the moment we're in. And um, it, it really is an inspirational book in that moment. But um, one thing you talk about in particular in your own life, but more generally, is the importance of um, connection with nature and with your community. And I thought maybe you could just, um, before we start exploring the practical solutions, just tell us a bit more about you know, how you found so much meaning and purpose in your own life, despite all that loss you talk about, you know, the things that have helped you along this journey and have left you so motivated. Yeah, well, trust me, it was a very, very, very long road to get to that point. Um, and so it's a hard one inside. It wasn't really something that naturally came to me, I must say. And I'm, and I'm sure that many people on the line absolutely can relate to the sense of despair and the sort of crushing sense of um, grief that sometimes, uh, you know, descends when you are immersed in, in really realising that there's a big disconnect between the reality of the situation that's unfolding and the response. And when there isn't an adequate response, it can leave you feeling really powerless and hopeless and, and feeling like um, really there's not much you can do. But then, you know, I guess for me, as an IPCC author, I looked around me and I just saw altruism really reflected back. You know, here are all these people from all over the world 
volunteering their time to actually produce this report as for free without getting paid. And then you start to look out into the rest of the community and I could see, you know, the frontline workers um, with the COVID-19 crisis working around the clock. Uh, and then, you know, you think about things like um, the fireys that go out and try and protect our precious places during times of great tragedy that we saw, for instance, in the Black Summer times. And then I realized that there is this element um, of human nature that is inherently good. And so even when you lose sight of that, sometimes mm. you can feel like nobody's listening, humanity's screwed and all, and so on and so forth. But then when you actually start to look around you, um, I really realized that I was surrounded by incredibly um, altruistic people and other people in, in the community at large, people I don't necessarily even know, but inspiring people that go out there and do something for the collective good. And it made me realize that, okay, in the event that the, the ship is sinking, which side of history do I want to be on, firstly? And secondly, you know, do I want to be part of the group of people that actually try to do something about it? Or do I just curl up in the fetal position, give up and despair? Because when because it turns out that we are living in into this really pivotal moment in human history. And how we show up in every single moment really matters. It really does. And this is one of these things that I I think I really took away from the IPCC experience is the sense of urgency. This is the reason why I put aside my own research and, and just wrote this book like a demon for about nine months uh, because I felt like the most important thing I can do right now is, is try and share everything that our community knows as far and wide as possible in ways that I hope are really helpful because sometimes there's a lot of misinformation out there or doomism or people misconstrue the science, or they think that the world's going to um, blow up from a methane bomb, or you know the North Atlantic and tipping points. And oh my God, I'm totally overwhelmed. And I get this from my students, and I get this from a lot of people, right? And so I wanted to write a book that really spoke to some of these anxieties in people, just gave them um, give to give people a better grounding in terms of understanding that the science doesn't, the evidence base is is not saying. The apocalypse is a done deal here. It's not. One of the key messages from our report is how bad we let things get is still in our hands. Mm. And this is what I want people to understand is that we shouldn't just sit here and say 1.5 is a foregone conclusion. That's completely, we might overshoot. We're very likely to overshoot, in fact, but coming back. Okay. And so how bad we let things get really is up to us. Mm. And so that led me into a whole other a whole other journey. But, well, so the first thing is really just understanding that there is goodness in humanity. It was all around me. So it was sort of staring me in the face, but sometimes you can lose touch with that. And then I realised that there's actually enormous political and consumer power that we have to be part of those systems that are, are trying to create the critical mass that's going to create the social tipping point that flips the system. And, of course, we've just seen this play out in the federal election, right? So... It isn't a done deal in terms of well, there's still a lot of work ahead of us. And I, I understand you had Chris Bowen here um, not so long ago, um, which would have been a really interesting conversation. I'm sorry I couldn't make it. But the point is, is that we are starting to see these social tipping points. And that comes about from individuals voting in ways that get behind people that reflect their values. So we either create or remove the social license for these things to continue. And so here in Australia, we're at a very, very important moment in terms of because we're such a large exporter of um, gas and coal and all the fossil fuel, um, the fossil fuel industry is still very powerful in our nation. We need to take a stand and say no more. We cannot afford to do it. We've already cooked the planet with fossil fuels and we don't want to do this until the very bitter end. And so what happens here will infiltrate out into other places. And so... Um, so that election for me was was really a pivotal moment, and it, it, and I actually I wept. I'm sure many people did, mm -hmm. um, watching those those um, those results come through, and then hearing the new prime minister um, speak uh, about an apology to our indigenous people, and it felt like a moment of healing. It felt like a moment that we could actually choose to redirect our cultural values, our cultural norms about what we how we want to be reflected. 
um, at, up, at the highest political levels, but also, you know, even at local levels as well and state levels. Um, but it, that's really made up of our, our communities and we can get behind those people. And finally, you know, right the wrongs of the past, we can start to think about writing a better future, telling better stories. And, and for me, then all of a sudden, I really sort of felt like, yeah, there, there is actually some hope here. And when I started to read um, material, I started to dip into, um, you know, history and, and politics. And I realised that these great social movements really characterise and punctuate human history. And this is just the latest in a long, long line of these tug of wars for social justice. So whether it's the vote for women or slavery and all that sort of thing that we finally said enough is enough, we can't do this anymore. And the good thing about this particular moment is that it's global. And so this global citizenry that is really rising up, I, I feel is, is incredible. And the way that people look back at say the 1960s and say, wasn't that a revolutionary time? Well, we're gonna look back probably at the 2020s in that way and say, I lived through that. And this is how I showed up. Absolutely. And I think <clears throat> it, it's impossible to read this book without coming out and thinking about that. You know, I mean, <laughs> this is our moment. What am I going to do? And I think there is so much that, that we can do. And you, you lay that all out beautifully. Um, just one question. It's probably going to annoy you if I ask you this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, look, you quote some remarkable leaders from the past in here and all the lessons we can learn through history. One of the people you quote a couple of times is, is Martin Luther King. Uh, we're now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. Now, I think you've given us the answer to this already, but it is one that comes up again and again. Is it too late? No, absolutely not. And it's sometimes I like to use an analogy of if you had a sick relative, just say your partner, your mum, your dad, your child was sick and they had cancer, for instance. Would you say, as soon as you get the diagnosis, would you say, oh, well, they're going to die anyway, so I'm not going to do anything about it? No, no one in their right mind would behave in that way. Tumors can be removed, lifestyles can be changed, you can get on top of things. So basically, the IPCC report is an enormous planetary health check of where we're at. And we are saying in very, very clear terms that we are destabilizing the ice sheets, we're changing ocean circulation, we are disrupting ecosystems and we are really shifting the equilibrium that we have been um, adapted to for thousands of years in ways that are really rapid non-linear and going to come in, in and surprise us in ways that we're not even really prepared for and so my argument would be that it's never going to be too late there's so much worth saving and how bad we let things get is still in our hands and so the difference between 1.5 degrees of warming and 1.6 and 1.7 and 1.8 and so on and so forth, they have really, really real implications in terms of ecosystems, populations, and, and, and it really does determine how much we can save. And so I, I think that we need to do absolutely everything that we can to stabilise the Earth's climate. And the good news is, is that geophysically we can do this. It's really linearly related to our carbon emissions. And so that then becomes a political, a social and political um, question, if you like, because the science is there. And I've been saying this, and people like David Caroli have also been saying this for a really long time, that climate change is no longer a scientific problem. It is actually a social and a political problem. So that actually is quite inspiring because we all have political power and we all have the capacity to exercise, um, you know, our... our our agency, I guess, and do something and get behind your values. And this isn't the moment to stand on the sidelines. You know, as we saw in the, in the last federal election, every single vote matters and counts of who the, the balance of power shifts in this direction. And I really feel like, well, globally right now, um, we're really at this profoundly important moment in terms of do we destabilize the planet in ways that you know do cascade off into um, really horrendous tipping points and all sorts of things we really want to avoid. But the good news is that once you start to bring emissions down, temperature does stabilize. So it does come down. And so there's a lot of um, 
resilience in the system. That's not to say it is, it, you know, it, I believe it is going to get worse before it gets better because we're still nowhere near where we need to be. So currently implemented policies globally for the Paris Agreement see us warming between around about two to four degrees, depending on um, exactly what is um, how these uh, estimates are in terms of climate sensitivity and a range of other different factors. But that just goes to show that the political response is entirely inadequate. So what are we going to do about it? Mm -hmm. um, now, Joelle, there's a couple more questions I want to ask before we take some to our from our community. Sure. I just want to briefly take us back to where we were before about the motivations to really do all of this, to become part of those incredible social movements, to be doing all these things that we know we can do to turn things around. Um, as you've spoken to us about, obviously, understanding the urgency, getting the right perspective on this. Every fraction of a degree matters. You know, everything we do is measured in, you know, a better future. Um, you've talked also about, you know, reconnecting with that sort of inherent uh, goodness and altruism you see around everywhere. Another thing that's woven through the book on a few occasions is the importance of um, reconnection with our communities and with the natural world as well. And you talk in a couple of places about the wisdom and knowledge of Indigenous communities and, in fact, how we all need to recover some of that innate understanding of our connectedness with all life and the, the care that naturally flows from that. Um, and I know you've, you've learned a lot about this along the way and I was wondering if you could share, you know, how can we foster that kind of connection and that community in the, in the modern world when a lot of us are kind of cleaved off if we've lived through coronavirus and everything else? What's really worked for you to kind of reconnect in those important ways? Yeah, I think one of the things I, I really hope to do with this book is, is to try and resensitize people to the beauty that's out there in the natural world and, and in our communities, obviously, as well, but also feel that these are things worth fighting for um, because, you know, you can break things. And sometimes there is, a, there, there is a point after which you can tip something and break it and, and, and things can, can really shift in ways that are, that are really, um, I guess, unfixable. But for me, I guess my motivation comes from feeling that, you know, we live in an extraordinary country like Australia. We have the highest level of um, diversity and biodiversity of any nation in the world, more unique plants and animals than anywhere else on the planet you know, more than places like Brazil and Papua New Guinea and Madagascar. Like Australia is absolutely extraordinary. And I even quote um, David Attenborough and how he talks about how Australians have a very unique role in terms of all of this. And so we only have to look around us to realise that we can either choose to be exploiters of nature or custodians. And our Indigenous communities, not only here in Australia, but elsewhere around the world, this is what they've been doing since time immemorial. We've strayed so far from our inherent humanity into these disconnected, fractured, flicking through on our screens, disconnected from the natural world and from each other. And that is a problem. It is resulting in a whole range of mental health issues of people feeling isolated, losing a sense of purpose, and also just feeling disconnected from the life force that sustains us all. Right now, we're seeing collapsing ecosystems in our biosphere, like big chunks of our biosphere are failing us right now. And that's because we are failing nature, you know? And, and I think when we, if we become so desensitized to the pain that, that's out there in the world and the reality of actually coming to terms with what it means to be part of this generation that is bearing witness to this, then, then there's no hope really. Like if, if we can just look at that and be really numb and siloed off and not care, well, then we've got a problem, right? But I would argue that the vast majority of people that aren't psychopaths, sociopaths, narcissists, and the rest of it actually care about this. Most people really do care about a habitable future. They care about the future of their children. They care about the ecosystems that they love. And they actually care about equality. They care about making the future a better place, not a worse place. Um, than, than, um, has co than what's come before. And so I think it's about telling better stories about instead of the destruction and the degeneration, what about the regeneration and the rebirth of hope? And how about we vision up what we actually want for our future? And I think these are the stories we need to tell because 
while it's fantastic to see all of the fan, like really impressive um, you know, technological fixes that are out there, and I write about the, the highlights of that in terms of the rene renewable energy um, revolution that is going on out there and the restoration of ecosystems, but it comes back to this, what I think is the most critical element, which is this cultural change that we need. We need to reassess our values about the things that we care about. So if we're seeing the Great Barrier Reef collapse right now, are we all good with that? That's all cool and normal, we're fine with that? Or is that actually an issue? Is that something that we say, no, not on my watch, right? And so that that is, you know, the cultural values that we hold collectively, we all contribute to that. Collectively, we make a decision about what's meaningful. You know, what, what do we what do we value? What do we care about? Mm. And so this starts to stray quite far from science. And so it took me into really interesting places because I realized that this is this is about what does it mean to be a, a human being at this moment in time? At the moment where our planet is literally losing its equilibrium, which is an extraordinary thing in itself to get your head around, honestly, it's, it's, it's huge. What does it mean and how am I going to show up and be a part of this? And not everyone has the same capacity, so it comes back to that one of your original questions, Simon, about the inequality. So if you're someone in Nairobi or you're someone in Jakarta, you know, or Mexico City, you don't have the same capacity necessarily as somebody who might be in Sydney, in Melbourne, in London, New York. I know there are inequalities in all those places as well, but still, right, we can all do something. And it doesn't mean you have to be a climate scientist, doesn't necessarily mean you have to be like a hardcore activist. There's so many different ways you can engage in this. And so I, I really explore those issues in my book. And for me, that felt like a pathway out of what felt like you know, the heartland of grief and through to the other side to something else that felt really, it felt real to me. It felt like it was something that feels like a universal truth. And that is because it is part of human history. As I said, all these great social movements have come about. There is a life wants to live, right? There's a momentum out there. It's extraordinary. This planet is extraordinary, right? And we happen to be living at this moment. We're part of this generation that we can either choose to step up and be custodians and, and right the wrongs of the past and heal those relationships with each other and care about those things because the way that we treat each other is really reflected in the way we treat the natural world. And that's something Mahatma Gandhi, I quote him, you know, there's so much wisdom out there. We've got, and as David Attenborough says, we, you know, rising to this challenge won't require more intelligence. It will require wisdom. And there's a difference there. And the good news is, is that there is collectively, there's so much wisdom out there. And we just got to tap into that. We've got to harness that and mobilize. And I think then we write our future. We write our future. And, and for me, that's what I hope this book is going to help do is fuel this social movement that's already out there. But I just wanted to give it a bit of a kick as a climate scientist, putting my sort of two cents in. Here, guys, this is the state of what is going on here. I've distilled all the IPCC highlights for you. Trust me, that was a really, really, really big job. I hope you appreciate it. Um, and then you will figure out what role you can play in all those different communities you're a part of, the spheres of influence that are there for you. It doesn't have to be lofty and grandiose. It can be small and it can be quiet. Everybody has something that they can do. And so do that thing that fires you up, that gives your life meaning, that makes you feel like you, you can be proud of, you know, what you're doing right now at this moment in time. Well, that's wonderful. Thanks, Joelle. And look, to be honest, it's very hard to build on the wisdom that you're sharing with us and what you've packed into this book. And that's just the most fantastic sentiment to lead us into the discussion. What I might do is just to let you catch a breath. There's one paragraph in here. It's one of my favorite in the book that I think is, um, I mean, this is only gonna recap what you've just said to us anyway, but I do feel this is quite wonderful. Um, <clears throat> it is incredible to realize that we're living through an era when profound transformation is happening before our eyes. And we're living through history in the making, the time that will be talked about for generations to come, to truly global movement that will transform life on our planet. What a miraculous time to be alive. 
And the best part is that there is room for everyone. There is no one way of doing things. Whatever you contribute will make a difference. So look, you're certainly giving me a kick and a lot of inspiration. I think our whole uh, community, as we know, that was a uh, an arduous few months, years, going through that process, uh, putting in all the effort to um, distill not just the science, but I think a phenomenal amount of um, insights and wisdom from the past and from the lived experiences of people all over the place. And it's uh, it's an absolute inspiration. And thank you for uh, sharing more of it with us in your own words and leaving us with so much good food for thoughts. Um, we're gonna jump into some questions that were pre-submitted by some of the wonderful members of the Climate Council community. Let me just check time. Perfect. We've got 20 minutes or 15 right. minutes. Um, so <clears throat> where should we go? Um, uh, let's go with this one from Anthony, first of all. Um, how can I communicate with young people about climate change effects and actions without causing increased and undue anxiety? Yeah, it's a really good question. I got asked this recently at a writers' festival. I think it's being, I think, you know, young people are smart. It's about being real, but it's also talking about, you know, protecting the things that we love and trying to make things better. And maybe not overcomplicating things too much for them, because the reality is, is that the future is still up for grabs, right? So in the IPCC, we, we, we lay out a whole range of different scenarios. So just to, to, to dwell on the worst case scenario is, is not a helpful thing right now. And so what would be a useful frame for young people, I feel, is to say that we are custodians, you know, we are protecting things that we love, the animals that we love, you know, the ecosystems that we love and and most kids are very in touch with nature as well and they love things like animals and wanting to protect them and protect their homes so just bringing you back down to love and protection these are really basic things and so for me it's not overwhelming to people too much um, I know that's really hard and you know because the reality is is difficult but I think if you're straight with people then you at least you're not coming from a foundation of delusion like be real it depends like if, if the person is switched on to it then then meet them in that place and also let them realize that if they're say a teenager or older that it's okay and it's completely rational to feel upset or scared about those things um, but you can do something about it and that those negative feelings will eventually dissipate and pass but you can use that care that you have for the world around you to propel you into doing something that feels meaningful for your life. So in my case, I'm a climate scientist. I, that's a meaningful thing for me to do. But for somebody else who might be planting trees, for somebody else who might be teaching, you know, primary kids, it could, there's so many different ways. For an artist, it could be, um, you know, developing an, an incredible film that helps bring awareness or whatever it might be, uh, or even just bringing beauty back in and falling in love with the beauty that is in the world that we want to protect because let's, let's be honest, I think um, beauty and heartbreak sit side by side and it's this thing that we have to balance in our own experience of the world. And sometimes maybe the best thing is to go and sit in a tranquil art gallery and just observe art and just give your mind a rest. Mm. So I guess I hope that answers the question that I think be real but also just bring it back down to those things of being protecting the things that we love. And I think that's that's an empowering thing. Thanks, Joelle. I might just ask a, a follow-up actually, because I know earlier in our conversation, you started touching on some of what I call these convenient truths about the extra, and you know, you talk a lot about sort of visioning the future and uh, what it is we can create and both in terms of the technology, but also the cultural aspects. And I think you started just scratching the surface of, for example, how through renewable energy, we're putting a lot of power and democracy back into the system about how if we're supporting small scale producers, we're boosting food security, but meaning better rural livelihoods. And of course, through all of this, we're kind of weaving the fabric of our communities back together. Um, so, I mean, it's 2050, it's well within the lifespan of somebody, well, hopefully the two of us, as well as anyone born today. Mm. What are a couple of things you think we can actually really get excited about? You know, those kind of lights at the end of the tunnel that are actually going to make a future that's better than what we're faced with at the moment. 
Yeah, I think it's just realizing that we're laying the foundation for this future right now. And so the trees that we plant right now are the forests of 500 years from now. And that regeneration, we, we need to start that work. And the UN actually have this um, restoration of 30% of the, um, of the earth by, by, by 2030, this 3030 initiative, which I write about in one of the chapters in the book, which is a global movement really to try and restore our ecosystems and be part of that healing. And like, like I said, it's just righting the wrongs of the past and, and saying, hang on a sec, they're not my values. That doesn't represent what I care about. And so maybe we could be part of the people, the critical mass that say, no, I don't want to see the destruction of the Great Barrier Reef. I don't want to see the destruction and destabilization of the ice sheets. I don't want to see that. And so being a part, even the first step is just being aware of that. And then also, um, you know, using that uh, through your consumer and political power effectively. So there's so many different things you can do on an individual level, but also on that collective level. Um, but I think, I think it helps you feel, oh, there's a bit of distraction. Not sure what's going on there. That's me shuffling my papers, I think. Sorry, my bad. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, well, maybe that's enough on that question, but uh, I hope that helps. I'm sure it does. Thank you very much. Um, Different question. This one's for the, the, the science side of your brain, Joelle. Um, this is from Claudia. How much worse will it get before it gets better? Again, that's a really good question. I think it really does depend on how successful or not the uh, implementation of the Paris Agreement is. So COP27 is coming up uh, in November, and it is a really, really critical moment. Um, so how bad we let things get is as the headline statement of the IPCC is, is, is really still in our hands. So there is a, a certain degree of committed warming. I'm not going to lie to you. There, there is warming that will play out. But there's also, um, and there is absolutely the capacity for us to, once we re reduce our emissions, temperature will follow suit. And that is really good. And once we start to stabilise temperature, it allows ice sheets to start to refreeze and, you know, you start to just see that equilibrium come back in. And so the IPCC goes through it. I certainly highlighted in my book, um, the nuts and bolts of the numbers are all in uh, part one. Um, and so, yeah, I encourage you to, to have a bit of a read of the book and, and see that, um, my take on that. But obviously, until we have the political response, we're not going to get that response in the, um, in the Earth system. So this is why this social tipping point becomes critically important. And as I've said to many people now, this feels like the most important book I'm ever going to write. Nothing's going to matter in 10 years from now. And even the IPC, the seventh assessment report, which will come out in 2030, let's be honest, the carbon budget's not going to be in great shape if we continue on as we are. That's why many of us actually in the author team felt that sense of, um, we felt the significance of that moment. In the moment that we're in and that's that's really why I'm, I'm trying to convey as clearly as possible the scientific reality but the take-home message here is that it's still in our hands mm. well look on that note this question's from Priya and I know you've talked around this quite a bit already but this will give a chance to reinforce some things um how do we balance the urgency of action needed this decade uh, with providing climate hope well, that's a good question. I mean, the urgency is necessarily a part of this because I think if people feel like there's no, you know, we can delay, it doesn't really matter if we push this out for another five years or even 10 years or something like that. The reality is, is that every single season that passes is becoming even more erratic, even more extreme, and that's going to continue. We know that. There's chapter 11 of Working Group 1, is basically a whole um, summary of that. So I guess it's this beauty and heartbreak sitting side by side stuff as well. It's remembering that there's so much worth fighting for, there's so much worth saving and really joining those dots and connecting those things that are happening outside your own window and making those connections of realising this isn't just a freak occurrence of some strange heat wave that caused 50 degree temperatures at the Arctic Circle. This is actually 
fundamentally a shift in the equilibrium of the the atmospheric circulation of the planet as a result of changing the radiative forcing from heat trapping gases in the atmosphere that are caused by us. So I guess that 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 is the that is one of the challenges of this work is that I'm not going to lie to you and you all know anyway that there are there are hard days. There are going to be some days where you feel really rotten and you feel just this is so overwhelming. I can't deal with this. And on those days, go and restore yourself in some way, whether it is, you know, going out to nature, you know, immersing yourself in art or any of those things that wherever you find beauty or people that you love being in those communities that really nourish your sense of spirit and your sense of um, connectedness, all those things really, really, really matter. And so take care of yourself on the journey, I suppose, and um, connect with everybody that's around you and there are going to be days where you might feel isolated and with this knowledge that feels so huge. But trust me, that's why I wrote the book. I hope you find a companion in me. I see you. I, I'm there. Many of us are. I've just written I've just written something down. But you might have your own way of processing this. I'm sure you do. But it's just like it, it's going to play out very differently for everyone's individual lives. Well, thank you, Joelle, for the, I think there's a real kind of kindness and empathy woven through this book from somebody who obviously has, you know, grappled with this a lot over the last few years. And, you know, we certainly all do take a lot of, um, you know, your, your wisdom uh, through that and that solace to heart. It's really very useful to all of us. Can I say um, something on that point, Simon, that just feels important to say, you can take my book as a permission to actually feel whatever it is that you feel about this topic. And it's okay, you know, because, you know, sometimes people feel like, um, you know, expressing their emotions can feel like an indulgent thing or harden up, you know, just that kind of idea. It's not like that at all. We're human beings, we're relational beings, we need, we, we, we have to, like, when, when you feel like, your reality isn't met or reflected back or mirrored back, you can feel really isolated and that can feel like a pretty awful state. But I guess what I'm trying to do with my book is give you an insight into someone who's immersed in this stuff day in, day out. It, it does take its toll, right? But there, there's, there is a real um, restoration of hope that can come about when you start just reconnecting with other people, realizing you can do something. You don't necessarily have to do everything, but you can do something. And to me, that feels like a, a worthwhile thing to do. I mean, you know, we only get one life. You get this one precious life. What are you going to do with it? Well, you've given us some ideas. Um, I think we've got time for just a couple more questions. Um, mm -hmm. One Again, you've touched on already, but might flow quite nicely from that, especially with all the talk you've given us about social tipping points, collective action, and so forth. Uh, Tam, <clears throat> Tam asks, as individuals, we can make better consumer choices for the planet, but how do we get corporations, governments, and governments to take action? Yeah, again, it's really just getting behind using your own consumer power, as you've already identified. And then, you know, people make up... Um, you, you know, these different corporations and, and it's changed from within. And it's also removing the social license for bad behavior. You know, you can take your money away from say your superannuation scheme that might be funding fossil fuel projects. You can choose to move your money away from that. You can also choose to do so many different things on an individual level um, to get behind the people that are behaving more from their values rather than just their hip pocket of you know, profits and things like that. But this is what I'm talking about with the cultural change. So obviously you're awake to this, which is really, really good, but there's a critical mass of people in this space as well. And so eventually, we, you know, those companies have to have to go bankrupt because we're not going to support them, right? But, but, we're, but we are living through this moment right now. And there are lots of ethical uh, operations out there and you can choose to get behind those. So, you know, you can do that even just with your energy provider as, an, as just a really tangible example. You can choose to, to, to be a part of lending your influence or weight or whatever, or your dollars in a certain direction or not. And so that to me is a really simple thing that you can do. But we are living through this. We're literally reconfiguring the values that we have as a society right now. And one day we will look back at this moment and say, can you believe we used to burn carbon like that and talk about it like it was like asbestos or something, you know, crazy. So 
we're living through it. And you can choose to use your influence in many, many different ways. Well, Joelle, we're nearly out of time. And I know you've got to run down to the ABC studio shortly to keep spreading the messages from this book. Um, I'm going to wrap us up in a moment, but we've got one rather fun question from Sally here to end on. If you could have two minutes in a room with world leaders, what would you say to them? And you do have two minutes because we're going to have to wrap in a moment. No more fossil fuels. That's it. Fossil fuel era has come to an end. We need to mop up. We need to restore. And that's basically all I would say. That's it. We have to stop. It, it, it has to stop. I mean, it's as simple as that. It is madness. And that is basically what I would say. And I would also say that we need to put more voices, more diversity in these decision-making realms that bring more wisdom from different parts of the community. So it's not just the same, you know, old white men talking to each other, that we have a real diversity of voices. Um, I'm, I'm, I think that um, just like ecosystems, you know, diversity is, is really where the richness comes um, in the world around us. So I guess the final thing to say is that we are living through this extraordinary moment and it can be overwhelming, but it's also in the frame and your perception of it as well. So, and that might change from day to day and that's totally okay. Um, but I hope that my book at least seeds a few ideas to maybe think about things in a, in a slightly different way. Well, what a great bit of clarity and simplicity and truth to, to end on. Um, Joelle, thank you again so much for this, this fantastic book, for taking this hour to talk to us. I've certainly got an enormous amount out of the conversation. I've no doubt our own, a whole community has, as we've discussed and as you've led us through, this really is humanity's moment. It's time for us to all rise to the challenge. We know what we have to do. We just have to get it done. And um, you're, of course, out there spreading this message of action and hope. And the Climate Council has a stack of your books. Thank you. Uh, we're going to be offering a signed copy to the first 100 people who sign up as a regular giver to the Climate Council by the 7th of September. Um, everything that we do together as the Climate Council community is, of course, enabled by people's wonderful generation uh, donations. You know, together we are very powerful. We are a small part of this incredible movement, this uh, you know ecosystem for change that you've um, been talking to us about, Joelle. And it's an incredible privilege to be part of that. Thank you, everybody, for the contributions and your supports for the Climate Council. Uh, we're proud to say that we're Australia's leading climate change communications organization. We're made up of some of the country's leading climate scientists and communicators like Joel, health professionals, renewable energy policy experts. We rely on that community support. Thank you again. Do consider signing up, joining us if you haven't already, so we can continue to be part of this change, part of humanity's moments. So thank you to the live audience for watching. Watching, If you've missed any part of it, um, you can watch the replay, which is going to be available. We'll get that email to you. There'll also be a link to purchase Humanities Moments, um, which is going to be popped now into the chat. I hope you've all enjoyed tonight's discussion as much as I have. Uh, thank you again, Joelle, for this opportunity. And good night, everybody. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thanks, guys.